Good afternoon, and welcome to NACIS's webinar entitled, The Refund Policy. And just to go over a few housekeeping items, this webinar will be recorded and will be available for review on our NACIS homepage under the Events and Webinars tab, then click on Recorded Webinars. And within 72 hours after this session has concluded, the recorded version of this webinar will be available for viewing. For any questions that you may have regarding this webinar, please feel free to contact today's presenters directly, and their contact information will be provided at the end of today's presentation. With that, I'd like to officially welcome you to NACIS's refund webinar. Presented by Vita Teagle, Compliance Coordinator for NACIS, and Monique Torres, Compliance Coordinator for NACIS and moderated by me, Alicia Williams, the Director of Human Resources and Training for NACIS. So with that, I'll turn it over to Monique to get today's session underway. Monique. Thank you, Alicia. And hello, everyone. My name is Monique Torres. And I'm Vita Siegel. We are Compliance Coordinators here at NACIS. We're the presenters today on this webinar about refunds. We have a lot of material to cover in a short period of time. So let's get started. Let's start by discussing why refunds are so important. There are several answers to this question, not least of which is that there are, a, there are five criteria under Standard 7 dealing with refunds. There are a total of 10 criteria in the entire standard. So the criteria dealing with the refunds account for nearly half of the standard. The limitations that are frequently cited during on-site evaluations under Standard 7 commonly relate to, the, to refunds. Why is that? because the other major group of criteria that fall under Standard 7 have to do with the financial statement. Those are Standard 7, Criteria 1 and 2, and those criteria are not evaluated on site. So if you can do your refunds correctly, there is a good chance that you will have no limitations under Standard 7. Each of the criteria dealing with refunds has a D beside it, which we will see in just a few moments. That D means that there are, these are documented criteria, the NACIS team that comes to your school will look for physical records to show compliance, or at the very least, electronic records that can be printed if needed. Finally, other agencies look at refunds as well. Back to you, Vida. Thank you, Monique. So here's what to expect in this webinar. First, we'll go through each of the five criteria dealing with refunds. We'll look at each criterion. Please refer to NACIS Standard 7, the NACIS will draw some of the policy and checklist which can be found on page 39 of the 2016 NACIS Handbook and the NACIS Sample Forms and Guidelines. Monique will be quickly reviewing the standards. Thank you, Vita. As noted earlier, there are five criteria dealing with refunds under Standard 7. Here we see a screenshot of Standard 7. The first of the criterion dealing with refunds is Standard 7, Criterion 3. The last is Standard 7, Criterion 7. I will be back with you shortly, but for now, I will turn the discussion over to Vida. Thank you, Monique. Let's quickly go over the definition of the refund policy, which reads as, a published statement explaining the method by which a student's account with the school settles should be the student withdrawal from a program study. Of course, it must comply with the NACA withdrawal settlement policy and checklist and applicable state and federal requirements. And you can refer to our source of our NACA glossary. Now here are the standards that are directly related to the refund policy. Standard 7, Criterion 3. Unless superseded by a state, federal, or program mandated refund policy, the institution shall adopt a policy that complies with the NACIS withdrawal settlement policy and checklist. Now here are a few important reminders regarding the refund policy. The refund policy must clearly outline the obligations of both the institution and the student and provide details of the cancellation and settlement policy of the institution. The refund policy must be published in the school catalog. And of course, you look at the catalog requirement checklist 14. The refund policy must be published in the school contract and or enrollment agreement. And of course, you can look, refer to this in enrollment agreement requirement number 11 of the checklist. Moving on to policy 7.01, which on settlement policy and checklist, now, of course, it states the intent of the NACA withdrawal and settlement policy and checklist is to see that each applicant and student is assured minimum conditions of refund 
and that the institution will be assured of its integrity of its meets the standards. I will now shortly turn over the discussion to Monique. Thank you, Vita. Here's the sample of the first four items of the withdrawal and settlement policy and checklist. Something important to note is that items one through four apply to all schools, whether they have a state mandated refund policy or are following NACUS's refund policy. So the four items that apply to all schools are, is item one is stated in clear language that can easily be understood. Item two applies to all terminations for any reason by either party, including student decision, course or program cancellation, or school closure. Item three complies with the main mandated policy. Item four requires the refund calculations are performed and refunds are made timely as outlined in standard seven, criterion seven. Now time to review the remaining items of the NACUS refund policy requirements. Let's start with items five and six. Item five states, the institution must identify whether refund calculations are based on actual or scheduled hours. Now, what is the distinction between actual and scheduled hours? Actual hours are based on the hours a student has actually attended school. Scheduled hours are the amount of hours the student is scheduled to attend, regardless of tardiness or absences. Here is a good example that will help us understand scheduled hours better in relation to calculating refunds. Cleopatra is scheduled to attend Mark Anthony Cosmetology School eight hours a day, five days per week. Therefore, she is scheduled to attend 40 hours per week. But if she misses one day at the end of the week, she will have 40 scheduled hours, but only 32 actual hours. Now, why would a school choose to calculate its institutional refunds based on actual or scheduled hours? Well, it is the school's choice and their preference. A school may choose to calculate refunds based on scheduled hours, for the refunds are based on the amount of hours the students are scheduled to have obtained. This can be at times easier to keep record of, since a school may be able to easily track when, a student are, when students are to reach a specific scheduled hours within their enrollment program of study. The refunds that are calculated using actual hours are based on the actual hours a student was in attendance of the program they were enrolled. Typically, refunds based on actual hours are more accurate. The next item we will be discussing is official cancellation. Here's a sample of where this can be found in the policy itself. Here are some helpful reminders for official, cancel, official withdrawal dates that can definitely help in the future. These are all the earlier of, of the series of dates. Not accepted, cancels within three business days of signing contract, cancels more than three business days of signing contract, the prior to starting classes, notifies the institution of his or her withdrawal, leave of absence or LOA, or if the student is expelled. Let's test our knowledge. Samson is an unhappy barbering student. On May 1st, he sends official notice by traceable means that he is withdrawing from Delilah Barber College. The letter is date stamped on May 2nd and is due to be delivered on May 4th. However, also on May 2nd, he violates the school's rules and is expelled. What is the official withdrawal cancellation date? May 2nd. Why May 2nd? because the alternative withdrawal date is May 4th. Per the NACUS policy, the withdrawal date must be the earlier of these dates. Why does the withdrawal date matter? Because any money owed to Samson has to be returned within 45 days of the date of withdrawal. Nita will be reviewing a few more important items about the refund policy. Thank you, Minnie. Item number seven. An applicant is not accepted by the school and is entitled to a refund of all monies except a non-refundable application fee. Of course, the application fee cannot exceed $100, and this is item number 20. Items eight and nine are something we refer to as a cooling off period. Item eight, a student or legal guardian counsels a contract and demands his or her money back in writing within 
three business phases of signing the enrollment agreement, regardless of what the, whether the student has actually started training. All monies collected by school were refunded except the non-refundable application fee. Ap item number nine, a student counts the contract after three business days of signing, but prior to entering classes. In this case, students entitled to a refund of all monies paid to the school less an application fee, if applicable, and registration fee. Now, what is a notification of withdrawal? Of course, a notification, a student notifies the institution of his or her withdrawal. This notification may occur in varied formats, social media, mail, a phone call, email, and these are just a few examples in which notification may occur. Item 11 refers to the leave of absence policy. Item 11, a student on an unapproved leave of absence notifies the school that he or she will not be returning. The date of the withdrawal determination shall be the earlier of the scheduled date of return from the leave of absence or the date the student notifies the institution that the student will not be returning. Time to test your knowledge. Okay, Jill is a happy cosmetology student with a sick family member. She applied for a 60-day leave of absence on May 1st. She is scheduled to return Jack's Cosmetology College on July 1st. However, she decided while in LA that, the, that she cannot return. On June 1st, the school receives notice from Jill that she will not return from the LA. Now, what is the official withdrawal date? Of course, June 1st. Now, why June 1st? Because the alternative withdrawal date is July 1st. For item number 11, the withdrawal date must be the earlier of these dates. Now, why does the withdrawal date matter? Well, because any money owed to Jill has to be returned within 45 days of the date of withdrawal. Now, let's continue on with the refund policy. Continuing on with the refund policy, item number 12, of course, states a student is expelled by the school. Now, here is some helpful information regarding the determination of the official withdrawal date. In types 8 and 9 and 11, official cancellation of withdrawals, the cancellation date will be determined by the postmark on written notification or the date said information is delivered to the school in person. Now, back to you, Monique. Thank you, Vita. Here is some important information for clock hour schools. Unofficial withdrawal, item 14. Unofficial withdrawals for clock hour students are determined by the school through monitoring clock hour attendance at least every 30 days. Item 15 helps schools understand what is considered the last day of attendance, also known as an LDA. For a school that is required to take attendance, the required date of the refund is determined by counting from the day the withdrawal was determined. However, for clock hour schools, the refund is calculated based on the student's last day of attendance. This item is for non-clock hour schools. Unofficial withdrawals for non-clock hour students are determined by the student through monitoring of student's completion of class participation and learning activities, such as class assignments, examinations, tutorials, computer-assisted instruction, participation in academic advisement, or other academically related activities. How soon does a school need to refund a student? Any monies due a student, due a student who withdraws from the institution shall be refunded within 45 days of a determination that a student has withdrawn, whether officially or unofficially. Schools may have its preference, a policy that may require a less amount of days, such as 30, day, 30 to provide an applicable refund. But just remember, if, a, if you state this is in your policy, you will be held accountable to that time frame in which to provide the applicable refund. Vita will now be reviewing items 18 through 21 of the refund policy checklist items. Thank you, Monique. Mitigating circumstances can be something that can possibly affect the student's refund. Item 18, when situations and mitigating circumstances are in evidence, schools are encouraged to adopt the policy wherein the refund to the student may exceed the minimum tuition adjustment schedule. These are just a few examples of mitigating circumstances. Military deployment, a diagnosis with a chronic illness that has led to one being incapacitated, 
an unexpected mandated incarceration required by law enforcement, or one being a vehicle accident that leads to an extensive recovery time longer than anticipated. Again, these are just a few examples. Here are some important information regarding non-refundable items. All extra costs such as books, equipment, graduation fees, et cetera, that are not included in the tuition price are stated in any non-refundable items are identified. Did you know the application fee has a cap limit? Well, it does. Item number 20, a non-refundable application fee does not exceed $100 if applicable. Now here's a sample of the tuition adjustment schedule. Of course, for students who enroll in GIN classes, the following scheduled tuition adjustment will be considered in meet, meeting minimum standards for refunds. Now, how can you calculate the tuition earned by the school? Step number one, identify the program limits for the withdrawing student. Step number two, identify whether refunds are calculated by actual or scheduled hours. Number three, divide total hours as of last date attended LDA, actual schedule by program length. And step four, Identify where the percentage of program completed falls on tuition adjustment schedule. Example, Harmony Granger enrolled in a 1,500-hour clock hour cosmetology program. She completed 425 actual hours, but was scheduled to attend 500 during her enrollment period. The school calculates refunds based on actual hours. So, divide 425 actual hours by 1,500 contracted hours equals 28.33%. Now let's look at the previous table to help calculate the tuition owed. This will help calculate the amount Harmony's tuition owed to the school. Back to you, Monique. Thank you, Vita. There are various scenarios for program cancellations, one of which is before instruction begins. This is found in item 22 of the refund policy. If a course and or program is canceled subsequent to a student's enrollment and before instruction in the course and or program has begun, the school shall add its option, A, provide a full refund of all monies paid, or B, provide completion of the course and or program. Continuing to item 23, this is a reference of cancellations after instructions begin. If the school cancels a course and or program and ceases to offer instruction after students have enrolled and instruction has begun, the school shall add its option A, provide a pro rata refund for all students transferring to another school based on the hours accepted by the receiving school, or B, provide completion of the course and or program, or C, participate in a teach out agreement, or D, provide a full refund of all monies paid. The last scenario of program cancellations is school closure. If a school closes permanently and ceases to offer instruction after students have enrolled and instruction has begun, the school must make arrangements for students. The school has at its option A, provide a pro rata refund, or B, participate in a teach out agreement. This may not apply to all schools, but it is important to note. Collection policy items 25 through 28. Item 25, collection procedures reflect good taste and sound ethical business practices. Item 26, the name of the National Accrediting Commission of Career Arts and Sciences is not used in the institution's refund policy, nor in any of its collection efforts. Item 27, collection correspondence responding cancellation and settlement from the institution itself banks, collection agencies, lawyers, or any other third party representing the institution clearly acknowledges the existence of the withdrawal and settlement policy. And item 28, if promissory notes or contracts for tuition are sold or discounted to third parties, the third party must comply with the cancellation and settlement policy of the institution. We will now be reviewing some important information about Standard 7. Back to you, Vida. Thank you, Monique, for finishing that up for us. As we have discussed, there are five criteria dealing with refunds under Standard 7. Standard 7 Criterion 3 deals with the actual policy itself and to state the requirement another way, 
A school has to follow the NACA child and settlement policy and checklist unless our policy is superseded by a state, federal, or program mandated policy. Our objective for the remainder of the webinar is to discuss the additional criteria dealing with refunds, including some guidance. We will look at a case study. Then, studying criterion four, institutions participating in federal Title IV financial aid programs must perform an institutional refund calculation and return to Title IV calculation. Please note the following. A return to Title IV is not considered a refund. This is a return of federal financial aid. Therefore, if a school participates in Title IV program, the school must also do an institutional refund calculation or applicable refund calculation after return to the Title IV has been made. The common practice for the term to verify the RTT4 or return to Title IV calculation completed, but it's necessary not to verify for accuracy. If the RTT4 is not in the file, the team is directed to ask the school if they are kept elsewhere. If they cannot be provided, the team will cite a finding under Standard 3, Criterion 3. So please be aware that if your school participated in Title IV, the NACA's evaluation team will look for both an institutional refund calculation and RTT4 calculation. The school has to have both. If the team finds institutional refund calculation in the file, but not RTT4 calculations, the team to cite a limitation under Standard 3, Criterion 3. That criterion is catch-all provision for requiring the school to comply with all federal, state, and local statutes and regulations, including the NACA's rules of practice and procedure. Now back to you, Monique. Thank you, Vita. This standard should sound familiar to you, Standard 7, Criterion 5. The institution applies the applicable refund policy to all terminations for any reason by either party, including student decision, course under program cancellation, or institutional closure. Here is a sample of policy 7.01. It is almost the same exact language of NACA's withdrawal and settlement policy and checklist item 2, which is an all policy requirement. So again, a school has to apply its refund policy to all terminations for any reason by either party. Vita will now be reviewing Standard 7 Criterion 6 with us. This standard focuses on documentation of returning money owed in a timely manner. The institution maintains evidence that institutional refunds are received by the recipients in a timely manner, such as, but not limited to, a council check, bank reconciliation, sign receipt of a delivery, or documentation that refunds were disposed of or in accordance with the applicable federal or state regulations. This criterion shows the willingness of returning any money owed to the student is on the school. There have been instances where a team found that money was owed to a student. All the team found in the fall was a photography of a check made out to the student. This is not acceptable under this criterion. The school has to maintain documentation that the money was received by the student in a timely manner. Please ensure that refunds are paid back to students in a timely manner and avoid a limitation under Standard 7, Criterion 6. Monique will now be reviewing the remaining standards pertaining to refunds. The final criterion dealing with refunds is Standard 7, Criterion 7. It states simply, the institution accurately implements the applicable refund policy. The guidance on this criterion for team evaluation states, teams are to understand that NACIS is con concerned with three dates with respect to the withdrawal and settlement policy and checklist as follows. The student's last day of attendance, or LDA, the formal cancellation date, or date the institution determined the student has withdrawn, the date of the refund if applicable. Teams are charged with the responsibility of determining that a refund is made within 30 days or 45 days per policy of the date the drop was determined. For example, if the student's LDA is listed, the date of determination must occur within 30 days and the refund must be made within 45 days of that date. However, the school might not get around to completing the form until 10 days after the formal cancellation date but the refund is still due 45 days from the formal cancellation date. What date is not included in these three dates? The date of the actual refund calculation. The main concern is that any money owed to the student is paid back in a timely manner. Vita will now be presenting the case study regarding refunds that will help test that we, what we know about refunds. Thank you, Monique. 
And that brings us to our case study. Some of you might recognize this as a movie poster for a movie called The Hunger Games. The starring actress in the movie is Jennifer Lawrence. Let's assume that before Jennifer Lawrence became famous, she was a cosmetology student. Let's assume that she enrolled in 1500 clock hour cosmetology program at Triology Cosmetology School. She started the program on June 1st, 2011, and was scheduled to complete the program on June 1st, 2012. She agreed to pay $12,000 for tuition, $400 for a kit, and $100 for application fee. Notice the application fee is identified as non-refundable, and that does not exceed $100 which is required by the NACA's policy. Now, after Jennifer enrolled in the cosmetology program, she is cast in the movie and the movie becomes a hit. After the second week of release, it has grossed over a quarter billion dollars. So Jennifer decides that she does not need to complete her program at Triology Cosmetology School. This is her institutional refund calculation and it provides some of the information that we already know. We know her name, address, program, program length, program start date, and program end date. But now we see that she last attended school on October 3rd, 2011, and was withdrawn from the program on November 27th, 2011. The institutional refund calculation was completed on January 25th, 2012. As of her last bit of attendance, she had 312 actual hours and 480 scheduled hours. A few problems may occur to you. First, she last attended school on October 3, 2011, but was not with Johnson program until November 27, 2011. There are 55 days between these dates. Either one, the school can account for this period of time by showing that the student was on a leave of absence between both dates. Or two, the school is not monitoring for unofficial withdrawals at least every 30 days, which is required by the NACA's policy. Let's assume that there is no evidence in the student file to show that the student went on LOA or leave of absence. That is one problem. Also, the institution refund calculation was not completed until January 25, 2012. Although the date of the actual calculation is a concern, what is most important is that the refund due to the student was paid in a timely manner. Did the school pay the refund if it was due in a timely manner? We will come back here in just a few minutes, but please keep this in mind. Triology Cosmetology School based this refund based on, on schedule hours. So to determine the percentage of the program completed, we're going to identify the program list, 1,500 clock hours. Whether the school does it refund based on actual schedule hours, it uses schedule hours. And divide the number of schedule hours by the program list. I will now turn the discussion over to Monique. Thank you, Vita. Here is the student ledger card for Jennifer Lawrence. It shows that on June 1st, 2011, that is her program start date, that she was charged $12,000 for tuition, $400 for a kit, and $100 for an application fee. Also on that date, she paid $500 for the non-refundable kit and application fee. She made a check payment on July 5, 2011 for $5,000, and the following month, she made an additional check payment of $5,000. So tuition is $12,000 and the school can retain 70% of that amount, we will take 12,000, multiply that by 0 0.70, and we see that the school can retain $8,400 for tuition plus $500 for the kit and application fee. The school is entitled $8,900. The student paid $500 in cash and $10,000 by check, and so paid $10,500. Now we're going to take the amount that the student paid, subtract the amount, um, subtract the amount earned by the school, $8,900, and we see that Jennifer is due a refund of $1,600. At the bottom of the refund calculation, the team finds the note above. Assume there is nothing else showing that the refund was made. Is this a problem? Yes, this is a problem. Following is why this is a problem. Here are some common errors schools make with regard to refunds. While I review this list, see if you can find which common errors were made on the refund for, of Jennifer Lawrence. Common errors with refunds, late refunds, not monitoring for unofficial withdrawals at least every 30 days, not paying refunds within 45 days of withdrawal officially or unofficially, not using the earlier of two or more withdrawal dates 
especially with students on LOA, not re retaining documentation of payments of refunds, calculating refunds incorrectly, misapplying the tuition adjustment schedule, not consistently using actual slash schedule hours to calculate refunds, charging a student current prices instead of the prices agreed upon by contract. Were you able to pick out some of the common errors made on Jennifer Lawrence's refund? Some of the errors that were made on Jennifer Lawrence's refund were not monitoring for unofficial withdrawals at least every 30 days, not paying refunds within 45 days of withdrawal, officially or unofficially, and last but not least, not retaining documentation of payment of refunds. It didn't appear that Trilogy Cosmetology School was monitoring for unofficial terminations every 30 days. Her LDA was t October 3rd, 2011, but she was not dropped until November 27, 2011. The refund was not paid within 45 days of the withdrawal date. Instead, it was paid at the end of January 2012. And finally, the school did not retain documentation showing that the refund was paid timely. Congratulations, we have now finished the webinar on refunds. If you have any questions, please contact the Compliance Coordinator. Please join us in the future for more webinars. We welcome you to join us in future webinars. Please monitor the website all the time for more information. Now back to you, Alicia. Thank you so much, Vita and Monique, for taking us through the refund policy. That concludes today's webinar. And on behalf of the National Accrediting Commission of Career Arts and Sciences, we again thank you for joining us. Please refer to the staff directory on the NACIS website to reach your respective compliance coordinator and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.